Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining PQA today for our Quality Forum webinar. Uh, my name is Richard Schmitz. I am PQA's Senior Director of Communications. It's my privilege to moderate today's discussion. I'm joined by Jake Galdo, who is PQA's Senior Director of Performance Measurement. Jake will handle the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, before we begin with the presentations, I just want to call a few items to your attention. Uh, we welcome your questions throughout uh, the one-hour webinar. The attendee lines are muted, but you can submit your questions using uh, the questions feature in the webinar uh, control panel, and then we'll ask the, our presenters the questions at the end of their sessions. Uh, this forum is being recorded, and within a week, we'll distribute a copy of the presentation, slides, and the audio recording uh, through PQA's uh, member portal. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we welcome your feedback. At the end of the webinar, there will be a quick survey that will launch, and your feedback will help us ensure that, that these and similar forums are meeting your needs and interests. Uh, before we get started, I do just want to point out three upcoming events uh, of, of note. There will be a second Quality Forum webinar two weeks from today. That one will focus on charitable pharmacies, so be on uh, the lookout for a registration notice for that, which will be delivered soon. Uh, and then in November, two events back-to-back -back here in Alexandria, Virginia. First is a Social Determinants of Health Forum, exploring medication access and quality. Uh, that is a, a broadly open stakeholder forum. And then uh, right after that at the same location, the 2018 PQA Leadership Summit. Uh, so uh, hope that many of you can join us for both of those. Uh, so now I would like to uh, jump into today's uh, webinar, uh, Improving Quality Through State-Initiated Innovative Pharmacy Practice, and I'll introduce our presenters. Uh, speaking first today will be Alex Adams. He is Executive Director of the Idaho State Board of Pharmacy, and in that role he promotes, preserves, and protects the health, safety, and welfare of the public through the effective control and regulation of the practice of pharmacy in the state of Idaho. And second will be Jeff Rashawn. Jeff is Chief Executive Officer of the Washington State Pharmacy Association. Uh, Jeff's committed to ensuring that pharmacists are recognized, engaged, and valued as essential to the healthcare team uh, to enhance patient safety and health outcomes. Uh, the learning objectives for today uh, I will run through quickly. The first is to be able to describe the current innovations and strategies used in state pharmacy practice to improve quality of care. Uh, second, characterize the role of new business models, technology, and other common elements of innovative pharmacy practices. Third, detail the legislative and regulatory environment necessary to innovate pharmacy practice to improve quality of medication use. And fourth, to be able to identify and evaluate trends and opportunities for the implementation and use of quality measures and programs and practice sites. Uh, so with that under our belt, I will turn uh, the controls over to Alex. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Richard and Jake. Uh, just to confirm, can you guys hear me? We can. Outstanding. So, well, uh, greetings from sunny Boise, Idaho, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, join you all this morning uh, or afternoon, I guess, on East Coast time. And I was asked to speak a little bit about the regulatory environment as it relates to uh, pharmacy practice and its nexus with, uh, with quality improvement. What I was hoping to do uh, was start off with um, differentiating two terms, the term scope of practice and uh, clinical ability. So scope of practice is a term that to me means the activities that a health professional is permitted to engage in and it's defined by the state's laws and regulations. So states define a pharmacist can provide certain services, such as uh, prescribing for certain drugs or administering certain drugs or ordering and interpreting lab tests. And because it's determined by the political process, it drives geographical differences. What an Idaho pharmacist can do is slightly different than what a Washington pharmacist could do or an Oregon pharmacist or an Alabama pharmacist for that matter. And because it's determined by the political process, scope of practice laws are generally one size fits all. It treats all pharmacists in the class the same, regardless of what their uh, education and training is. If they went on for board certification or residency training, it applies to anyone who's in that license category. And because it's determined by the political process, scope of practice is generally static. It's 
to change the legal scope of practice of a health professional, it requires a change of law, either a statute change or a regulation change through an agency such as the Board of Pharmacy. When you compare that to clinical ability, it's a term uh, I use to, to mean the true competence and ability of the health professional. And it's not determined by the political process. It's determined by the education, training, career experience, and practice environment that the pharmacist uh, works in. For example, you know, some pharmacists might have access to an electronic medical record, or some might have access uh, to a broader healthcare team where they might have access to certain forms of technology that allows them to do things that a pharmacist in other settings might not be able to do. And unlike scope of practice, which is one size fits all, clinical ability is something that is individualistic. There's heterogeneity in any profession. Not all pharmacists are, are created equal, and uh, some pharmacists have different capabilities than others. And it's not static. Uh, clinical ability is naturally always dynamic. As self-directed lifelong learners, pharmacists can always take on new education. They can always go back for more skill-specific training programs. New technology might come out that takes something that was only uh, able to be done in inpatient settings and moves it either to an outpatient pharmacy or even the patient's home. So naturally, uh, clinical ability changes over the course of a career. And uh, the difference between these two terms is uh, what Barb Safry uh, uh, called the difference between can and may. Clinical ability is what a professional like a pharmacist can do based on their education and training. However, the scope of practice is what they may do based, based on their laws. And in many states, there's been a gap that has been growing, in my opinion, between can and uh, may. And the extent of that uh, varies geographically and has led to a lot of issues. Some pharmacists feel like they're not able to use their full faculty. Some pharmacists uh, feel like uh, their health systems aren't able to use their scarce human resources in the most efficient way possible. And it uh, has also led to, to some allegations that's led to uh, um, lower quality care when pharmacists aren't able to participate as a full member of the healthcare team. So I really wanted to differentiate those two terms. I think uh, my approach to regulation is that the overarching goal of health professional regulation should be to harmonize clinical ability with legal scope of practice and allow any pharmacist to, the pra to practice to the top of their full education and uh, training. And part of what we've uh, talked about as a board in Idaho is that market forces also regulate. In addition to the laws that we set either through the state legislature or the Board of Pharmacy rulemakings, there's all these other factors that play in. Even if a pharmacist is able to uh, administer a certain medication, are consumers willing to accept that and will they demand that from a pharmacy? Are payers going to pay for it? How does this align with some of the performance measurement programs either federally or in the state? What do private accrediting facilities uh, uh, think about that? Uh, do they uh, address it in their standards? What about facilities? You know, pharmacies have uh, significant risk mitigation teams that might look and see, well, what is the potential exposure to our organization if we allow pharmacists to administer that medication? Is it worth it uh, to us? What do liability insurers think? And then what if, what would the civil and uh, criminal laws be in play? And what, what are the professional ethics and self-restraint in play? So I think in Idaho in particular, our Board of Pharmacy has had the, the humility to, to acknowledge that the Board of Pharmacy is just one of the many entities that regulates the profession of pharmacy. And all of these external market forces also shape what is done on the front lines. And can we defer a little bit more uh, to those? So uh, over the past year, we've had a significant deregulatory effort to cut a lot of the bulk out of our rules. We actually cut 55% of our total rule uh, 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 word count out of our regulations and have generally started trying to defer more to external market factors where appropriate for public health and safety. So when we talk about um, progressive pharmacy practice, I think about it as a framework where the base has historically been collaborative practice authority, where um, Washington State and Jeff might speak to it, uh, you know, was the first state where pharmacists could enter into formal relationships with uh, the medical community and work under essentially a protocol where pharmacists were delegated certain authority by the collaborating physicians. And that has been a basis for pharmacists initiating and modifying drugs. It's been the basis for pharmacists ordering and interpreting lab tests in some states, things like that. But um, 
as I think about the sociology of professions and how professions develop, I think about independent practice and pulling authority outside of collaborative practice authority. Now, I want to be clear in that when I say independent authority, I don't mean non-collaborative authority. I think everything a pharmacist does should try to be consistent with the patient-centered uh, medical home care model and uh, work as a healthcare team for the betterment of patient care. When I mean independent authority, I mean as a matter of law, not requiring that formal collaborative practice or collaborative drug therapy management agreement that has, been, that has formed the basis for so much of a pharmacy practice to date. So when I think about independent authority, I separate it into four buckets, the ability to order and interpret tests, the ability to administer medications, the ability to adapt prescriptions, and the ability to independently prescribe uh, medications, at least in certain classes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what Idaho is doing, just as an example. So in Idaho, we don't have any specific restrictions on the ability to order, interpret, test, or administer medication. So if the question is, can a pharmacist administer a depot antipsychotic, uh, the answer is, well, it depends. There's nothing that legally prohibits it. Does the pharmacist have the requisite education and training necessary to not just administer the medication, but monitor the patient and follow up appropriately over time? If the answer to those questions is yes, then of course the law would support a pharmacist administering a depot antipsych. We do have more finite authority specifically listed in our laws for both adaptation services and independent prescriptive authorities. I wanted to just cover those uh, briefly. When I talk about prescription adaptation services, um, it generally means a pharmacist having the ability to modify a prescription written by a physician or another or another prescriber. So some of the things that can be done in Idaho is if a patient uh, runs out of uh, their, their medication, a pharmacist can extend a 30-day supply, no questions asked, one time in a six-month period to keep that patient on their therapy. I've seen some data out of PQS that would suggest what additional patients or what what, what sort of lift a pharmacy could achieve in terms of their proportions of days covered measures if the patients just had one additional fill. And uh, if pharmacists have the ability to extend that refill as a continuity of, of uh, care, uh, what, what a tremendous opportunity to help uh, uh, meet not just those adherence measures, but improve patient care and, and, uh, and patient outcomes. In Idaho, in addition to the renewals, uh, pharmacists have the ability to make certain changes at the pharmacy counter. Uh, pharmacists in Idaho were one of three states where pharmacists can do therapeutic substitution within the same class. So if a physician prescribed one statin and the preferred uh, drug list for a health plan uh, has another statin on it, a pharmacist could make that switch within certain conditions. For example, the patient agreeing to that switch. Um, Idaho pharmacists can also modify the dispensing quantity. Uh, so, for example, if a physician writes for a product and that the, the, the product that the physician wrote for is not commercially available, the pharmacist could use his or her professional judgment to modify that script to something that is commercially available. Um, with medication synchronization, I think we might be the only state where a pharmacist can extend the quantity of any drug that was written to get the patient to their, their synchronization date. So, if all my meds are due a week from today, and I'm started on a new blood pressure medication today, the pharmacist could take the prescription that was written, add seven additional days to it to get me to the sync date, and then start my monthly fills from there just as a way to streamline some of the, the, the processes that the pharmacist has to do so they're not as dependent on short fills or partial fills or any of the other things that create some of those administrative burdens for pharmacists. And Idaho pharmacists can also change the formulation or route of a prescription if a patient has difficulty swallowing capsules and a capsule was written, a pharmacist could use his or her professional judgment in working with the patient uh, to change that to a, a liquid formulation. So a lot of these things um, are things that we think really relate to the quality measures. If you look at a lot of PQA's measures, uh, medication adherence is, is certainly one of those. So a patient running out of refills could lead to that, that uh, gap in uh, therapy, or if a patient isn't able to take the drug that was written because they can't swallow it, the ability to change the formulation might be a mechanism of facilitating medication adherence. We do see this as having a nice overlay with um, uh, the, the, the quality measures that organizations like PQA have put forward. 
Similarly, I mentioned that uh, Idaho pharmacists have certain independent prescriptive authority. We do have a limited formulary of both drugs and devices that a pharmacist can prescribe from. Uh, without going into any any of these in too much detail, I figured I'd, I'd focus on a couple that relate specifically to PQA quality measures. So one of the uh, uh, measures that PQA has is what percentage of patients with diabetes between a certain age range are on statins. Well, one of the things an Idaho pharmacist can prescribe for, a pharmacist can prescribe a statin for patients with diabetes in accordance with the standard of care. So an Idaho pharmacist could prescribe a statin. However, because it's in accordance with the applicable standard of care, the pharmacist would have to do any of the blood work or lab tests that are necessary based on either clinical guidelines or the drug package insert in order to do so. And then the pharmacist would take responsibility for the follow-up and monitoring over time. Similarly, a pharmacist in Idaho can prescribe a spacer, which, believe it or not, is a prescription product. So if a pharmacist is working with a, an asthmatic patient and is counseling the patient at the counter and uh, realizes that their technique is not uh, proper or that the patient is really having a difficult time uh, with, uh, with using their albuterol inhaler, a pharmacist could use his or her professional judgment at that point in time uh, to prescribe a spacer. Uh, to that uh, patient. So um, rounding out the uh, framework at the top of uh, this, I see uh, the ability to delegate to support staff uh, certain activities. And I've portrayed that as the roof because the more we can delegate to appropriately educated and appropriately trained support staff, the more pharmacist time can be preserved for some of those higher order tasks, such as ordering and interpreting tasks, prescribing, administering or adapting prescriptions. So Idaho has a framework in place whereby a pharmacist can delegate any task to a technician as long as the technician has the education and training to take on that role. So we don't uh, micromanage as a matter of regulation what support staff can do. We defer to professional judgment of the pharmacist in making appropriate delegation decisions in accordance with the education and training of their individual support staff. So some of the roles that have emerged in Idaho, we do have technicians who administer vaccines. So a pharmacist makes the clinical decision whether or not to prescribe the vaccine for a patient, and then the pharmacist can use his or her professional judgment to delegate the technical task of administering the vaccine to the patient. Uh, that's taken off uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I've estimated around 30% of our technicians uh, who are certified in the state uh, have gone through training uh, on proper medication administration technique. Uh, we have pharmacies who tell us they're administering more vaccines than they've ever done because they now have increased the number of vaccine champions that they have in the store. And technicians in many, many cases are, are really the face of the store at the drop-off window and pickup window. And when the technicians are emboldened uh, on, on vaccinations, what a tremendous opportunity uh, to not just identify gaps, but to encourage patients to fill those gaps while they're in that, that store. Uh, the other thing we've seen taken off, uh, maybe to a lesser extent, is technicians can perform final product verification um, as uh, drugs are being dispensed out the door. And that, uh, as studies have shown, that uh, technicians can perform that role as safely and accurately as pharmacists while simultaneously freeing up pharmacists for some of those higher order, higher value tasks that can really improve patient care and public health. So what were some of the success factors in Idaho? As we navigated this, you know, we, we really set our compass on what, what the public health needs were. We didn't get bogged down on a lot of the intra-professional turf wars of what is, what, what is the proper role of technicians versus pharmacists. We, we really put our focus on what is in the best interest of public health and uh, patient care. And we attempted to leverage the experience of other jurisdictions. Now, one of the things that we find is that if you look, especially north of us in Canada, many of the provinces were ahead of us in terms of what the role of the pharmacist was. And uh, if you look uh, across the pond, you know, in the, in the United Kingdom, in New Zealand, and some of these other jurisdictions, they've really been on the forefront of using the pharmacist to the top of their education and training. And we were able to learn quite a bit from the publications and uh, the reports that have emerged from their governmental bodies. And uh, therefore, we didn't have to wrestle with a lot of the theoreticals of would it be safe for technicians to do some of these roles? Would it be safe for pharmacists to do some of these roles? We really took an evidence-based uh, approach and were able to learn from the, the collective wisdom of others. And that, that's the last point is, is using an evidence-based approach as, as you approach the regulatory process. Chances are any policy that uh, any, any state would be advancing has already been tried somewhere. 
So rather than wrestle with the theor theoretics of what could happen and, and what all the what ifs are, uh, learn what has happened. And I do think Idaho is, is certainly now one of those states where uh, folks might be able to draw some lessons learned in what has happened since since pharmacist has been able to prescribe for some of these things or what has happened since pharmacist have been able to adapt uh, certain prescriptions. So um, that's what I was hoping to cover. And uh, I'll turn it over to Jeff and we'll look forward to a robust uh, Q&A at the end. Okay, Jeff, you should now have control of the screen. Can you hear me? We can. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. I appreciate uh, uh, getting to share this exciting discussion with you and all the great work you're doing in Idaho. Um, now it's an opportunity for me to share a little bit about what's happening in Washington State, uh, these two states up in the Pacific Northwest sharing a border. Uh, we've been able to uh, really look at our Practice Act over a number of years. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the, the history of it and what's transpired in the last uh, three years uh, that may be uh, beneficial as, as we're looking at different ways to uh, expand the way pharmacists can help with patient access and care throughout the country. Probably about 10 years ago, I guess, uh, we really started looking at our collaborative practice, our, our quote unquote provider status. Uh, and we really took the uh, National Alliance of State Pharmacy Association's view of this three tiered approach to, to, um, to achieving this provider status. And it is largely based off of um, the, the components of provider designation, uh, optimizing your practice act, and then ultimately payment for service. And the first thing we did when we looked at this was said, you know, what's the external viewpoint of our provider status efforts and, and realized that we needed to align what we were calling it, looks like I'm on a timer here, uh, our, our, our alignment of our efforts with what to achieve, which was greater patient access to patient care services. So we looked at all these three components in, uh, in greater detail to see where we really needed to place our efforts. We looked at our scope of practice, our definition of our practice act, and we had some forward thinking leaders uh, that back in 1979, 39 years ago, uh, put together uh, an effort to redefine our practice of pharmacy and it included three major components. Uh, the initiating and modifying of drug therapy through written protocols and guidelines, the administering of all drugs and devices, and then uh, the monitoring of drug therapy and use. And those three core components have allowed us to integrate into pharmacy practice in, uh, in significant ways. Throughout the country, you're seeing these types of things. These are things that the, that the uh, pharmacists in Washington State have been doing in the public health arenas, uh, providing immunizations um, since the early 90s, emergency contraception to increase access to very timely uh, health um, services for, for patients in need. Uh, tobacco cessation and, and on through uh, to some of the current efforts in uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, that has been uh, uh, helping to, to fill public health gaps. All of these situations were, were brought to the pharmacists uh, saying, hey, we, we have a, a, a medical need, a public health need in our community. Uh, what can pharmacists do to help? And so at, over the course of a number of years, we really targeted uh, our efforts to use our collaborative practice in ways that uh, were, were already identified needs um, by our healthcare community and our partners uh, then collaborated with us in those places. Um, certainly in the chronic disease space uh, with the skill sets of pharmacists uh, post-diagnosis um, for handoffs and management of medications, uh, we've been able to, to get into a number of these spaces, and this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, there are more than 33,000 active collaborative practice agreements uh, that, that are currently on file with our Pharmacy Quality Assurance Commission. We have about 80, we have about 8,500 pharmacists in our state, 
uh, and so uh, you can see it's it's heavily utilized. Uh, but our main problem uh, in looking at this was not our ability to collaborate or not our ability to provide care, um, but the, the insurance coverage and the recognition by the payers. Uh, that seemed to be our glass ceiling as we had health systems coming to us, uh, medical clinics coming to us and saying, we have pharmacists on staff and we can't bill for their services. And we had pharmacists in the community saying, we, we would like to continue care. Why can't we um, bill this for, from a patient's insurance? So we really focused on that uh, as, a, as a, a first step to um, broadening access. What ended up happening was a need for a piece of legislation, but I do want to walk you through how we identified that. The first thing we did after talking to a lot of stakeholders was, was look at how insurance plans are regulated. And we identified a law that we call the Every Category Provider Law uh, that I understand is, is uh, similarly held in, in 15 states. Uh, and, and with that, we went to our insurance commissioner's office and said, hey, uh, this law appears to uh, allow and, and actually require um, pharmacists to be in these participate provider networks for, uh, for under the insurance uh, coverage and insurance benefits for, for patients. And um, through a course of a number of discussions over several years, we, uh, we really ended up with a, uh, a lot of runaround. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, we had a, a legislator, uh, leader, a pharmacist, uh, Linda Evans Parlett, uh, request a uh, AG opinion uh, to, to find out if pharmacists uh, fell under this this law, and that came back saying what we had known for years: the pharmacists, uh, quite honestly, um, you know, it was a silver bullet for us uh, that we thought was going to move the ball. But they said the pharmacists are healthcare providers, uh, and they should be um, included in these networks and paid for services uh, within the same confines as other healthcare providers. We brought that information back to the insurance commissioner's office and, and they, uh, they went about enforcing this law. I'm sorry about these screens. This uh, timing on these slides is apparently has a mind of its own. But ultimately what we ended up doing was providing a, uh, a, an argument to the insurance commissioner's office. They went to uh, enforce this and the plans um, said, hey, we think we are abiding by this because of the uh, pharmacists that we have in our PBM contracts uh, with pharmacies. And so we needed a, a law, uh, a piece of legislation to clarify that. And that was Senate Bill 5557. This was a one-year bill uh, and it was supported by the, the medical community as a whole. Uh, initially, it was we were neutral with the, from the Medical Association and their support uh, that we had a long history of collaboration with them. However, they uh, uh, we asked them what it would take to to uh, get them to support it, and they said, we just need to hear uh, that our members want us to support this. And over the course of a four-day period, we were able to get 23 letters uh, signed by medical directors that worked um, arm-in-arm with pharmacists in patient care settings, uh, and then the medical community, uh, the medical association said, you know what, we, we can support this bill. And, and ultimately, uh, even the, the health plans uh, recognize the value of pharmacists, the most of the concern was just in the time for implementation. Uh, but we successfully passed that in 2015. The bill itself um, was really simple. It essentially just said that uh, health plans needed to uh, recognize pharmacists as providers of care for medical benefits, as long as those services were within their scope of practice and those were covered services that were uh, within the essential health plan or in the, the, the services provided under the medical plan. It was no new services, it was all existing services, and it was limited by our scope. Um, and, and the purview of the insurance commissioner's office is over commercial carriers for large groups, small group, individual, and family plans. Our Medicaid program and our Medicare program, as well as self insureds that are regulated federally, were not included in this piece of legislation. Uh, we have had a number of discussions since with, uh, with self insureds and our Medicare Medicaid program. Uh, about uh, the inclusion of these uh, services in their uh, coverage plans and, and pharmacists in their systems. So this path provider status uh, went a little bit like this. Uh, there was legislation passed in May of 15, and then we, we had an advisory committee that was a part of the piece of legislation. We met, and ultimately uh, there were deliverables. Uh, this, this work was done under uh, the direction of One Health Port. Uh, they are a, a group that um, deals in 
um, healthcare providers um, connectivity with uh, the insurance community. Uh, there's been a lot of administrative simplification work through this through this body, uh, and they were a great uh, you know, platform for uh, a very robust conversation. A lot of this implementation advisory group were not pharmacists. We had representatives from all different areas. And at the end of the day, uh, there were three documents that were provided. Those documents were uh, essential for laying best practice standards. Um, but what didn't come out of that was direction on, on how uh, the medical community behaves in this space. Essentially, the work of that advisory committee was to say that pharmacists need to be treated like everybody else. Uh, and so, like every other healthcare provider, and that's what we had hoped to achieve. Don't treat us differently. Hold us to the same standards. We we uh, we want to um, you know act as every other provider. So what we found was that there were still a bunch of knowledge gaps, and we created these implementation groups um, over the course of the last few years uh, in the areas of contracting and privileging uh, uh, and credentialing, in areas of billing coding and documentation, uh, document uh, technology and communication, as well as outcomes and research. So I'll share with you a little bit of the work uh, that these groups have done. You know, first and foremost, the credentialing and privileging was an area that we, we really need to wrap our heads around uh, who is in charge of what aspect of, of this process and, and really the, the basis of those. And what we identified uh, first off was that this was just, uh, something that all healthcare providers did to, to you know, quantify and, uh, and defend the uh, quality assurance um, processes in place uh, to, to make sure that these healthcare providers were competent and ensure they're competent. That's public expectation, that's uh, other um, payer expectation, uh, and, and certainly from the standpoint of the purchaser. So uh, we really got an idea of how those processes take place for other healthcare providers, what pharmacists would need to do. And certainly, you know, those align uh, with value-based performance measures and uh, selling the importance to uh, to the public and to employers, but there's uh, various components in there that are unique for pharmacists, that, and, and it's not just the terminology because many pharmacies already use credentialing and privileging without maybe necessarily declaring it, um, but the peer assessment and, and monitoring uh, components and, and the, the continuous quality uh, assessment uh, of these credentials and the, and the privileges that they're uh, yielding to were an important part. So what we identified here was that uh, the a main portal for providers in our state was already uh, identified through some le previous legislation. It's called Provider Source, and it allowed pharmacists to integrate with all other healthcare providers into a, a credentialing database, and, and that would streamline their connectivity uh, with the plans for contracting and enrollment, and then recredentialing and the like. The next thing we had to do was really look at uh, the medical billing side. And the medical billing side uh, is kind of a different language uh, from the pharmacy claim billing side. And so uh, we, we looked to de demystify that. And uh, with that, we needed to, to take a, a greater look at uh, who all the moving parts were. And ultimately, we knew that we needed to put together some trainings. So uh, we created some on-demand trainings and some um, live trainings working with uh, billing professionals to to help train technicians that they can be in touch with uh, the in charge of the tech, the billing uh, at a medical billing level, same way that they are at a pharmacy billing level, uh, claim billing level, but also from the pharmacist understanding appropriate documentation and uh, and when what uh, codes were available and the like. Um, and we have a, a guidebook that's about to come out that we've been working with the medical association on. Uh, a royalty contract uh, for, for the use of CPT codes, but uh, all of this is, is work in progress uh, as we look to, to clarify medical billing. First thing we did was uh, we actually put together two different um, kind of visuals. One was the pharmacy claim billing cycle and then the medical billing cycle. Um, and in the pharmacy cycle, there's collection and verification, there's claim submission, there's payment, and there's patient care. Um, all the main core components, but the way they uh, line up uh, and then the IT side of it is, uh, were uh, areas where we needed to, to really focus. Um, clearly, in the medical billing cycle, the patient care is done earlier and it's a retrospective billing process. So uh, some of the IT connectivity and, and uh, um, back-end work 
uh, needed to be addressed. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, there are five gaps um, designated. And those were areas where the pharmacy management systems uh, weren't um, set up to, to address. And there was differences between the, the, the medical billing cycle and the pharmacy uh, billing cycle. And so uh, we really honed in on, on those and identified a need for uh, additional uh, vendor relationships to, to meet the needs. And, and some of that's in, um, in patient management software, um, more integrated connectivity to a health plan to identify initial eligibility of coverage, uh, working with billing services and clearing houses, and ultimately at the, the back end, some, uh, medica some uh, payment uh, rec reconciliation. So uh, lots of moving parts. Clearly uh, uh, an area where we had to, to provide some clarification, but uh, all very exciting things. But the real core to our work is, is I think, what lands uh, in PQA's uh, lap, and that is uh, the outcomes and research. We can get into these networks now, um, but we need to, to prove uh, our value. And so how can we utilize uh, the care that we're providing to align those with uh, the, the outcomes, uh, the metrics that uh, the health plans are held to uh, and, and the pharmacies and the and ACOs and the um, uh, the um, other en entities are, are graded on. And so we're working real closely um, with, with various entities to identify what those measure sets are, uh, what the health plans um, uh, see is valuable, and how we can line our efforts and our data collection to, to make sure that um, we're, we're seen as valuable and not competitive, but really uh, a, an important uh, team member in this space. We're looking at physician incentives uh, to to align with uh, the the uh, motivations of the physician community, um, and taking a, a greater look at uh, a various number uh, of uh, quality measure sets to ensure that uh, we can gather the right information and, and prove our value long term. So. We had a lot of moving parts. We're still uh, very, very much in the implementation role. Uh, a few years into this process, uh, we have uh, our, our steps are looking at addressing barriers for implementation, specifically in those community settings that didn't have uh, the the network of uh, medical billing support and IT support that our pharmacists are working in clinics and hospitals and, and long-term care facilities do, uh, and to, so that they can also uh, be a, a valuable uh, connector uh, and have the, the right data being transferred and shared in the appropriate way. So looking at the IT solutions and, and quite frankly, helping uh, the, the uh, work being done by those software uh, companies to, to understand what is going to be needed in these pharmacy spaces. And, and we're seeing great uh, efforts in um, development of new solutions in that space. And then uh, ultimately, with the, the uh, outcomes work, which we find is really, uh, it takes a lot of um, forward thinking and, and uh, uh, back thought, and we wanted to make sure that we were working with PQA and, and others to identify what those true value pressure points are uh, that pharmacists could to help to address with our uh, increased access to care. And with that, I think we're ready for some questions. Well, that's really, really exciting. Um, hello, everybody. Again, my name is Jake Galdo, and I'm with PQA, and I'm excited to help facilitate this Q&A session with Jeff and Alex. Uh, first and foremost, thank you both very much for uh, sharing your stories with us and really helping us think about pharmacy practice in a new light and in a different way, in the ways that you're you know, caring for your patients differently in your states. So I'm going to start with a question to Alex. Um, and in your presentation, you talked about the goal of harmonization and how you want to balance between the scope of practice and that clinical ability. Um, but one of the barriers or the differences you mentioned is that the scope of practice is very static, whereas that clinical ability is very dynamic. So how do you find that harmonization and how do you balance between those two polar opposites? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And it's uh... It's a difficult question because, like I said, clinical ability changes over time. Even if you wrote your laws perfectly, 
where it harmonized with the scope of practice or the, the clinical ability of everybody today, it's frozen in time and it could prevent that growth of what clinical ability could be tomorrow. And then just the other challenge is I really tried to, to hammer home how individualistic clinical ability is. A board certified PGY2 trained residency trained pharmacist might be different than me or Jeff, who hasn't practiced pharmacy in, in more than a decade. So it's you know, certainly they have more clinical ability than we do at this point in time. So um, it, it's very difficult. The way we did it is we transitioned to a standard of care approach, similar to what the medical and nursing profession have. So we have, uh, we have a law that outlines a decision-making process to help identify if something uh, can be performed by a pharmacist. So rather than having an itemized list of what pharmacists can do, um, we say if something is not expressly prohibited, it could be done by a pharmacist if it meets several, several factors. Is it within their education and training? And would another reasonably prudent pharmacist with the same or similar training do the same thing in the same or similar situation? So, you know, we talk about lab tests, for example. Could a pharmacist in Idaho uh, order and interpret an x-ray? Well, there's nothing that expressly prohibits it. Is it within their education and training? I would contend that it's likely not within the education and training of pharmacists today but there's nothing that would prohibit Idaho State uh, Pharmacy School from adding that as either an elective course or a core course and that being part of their clinical ability tomorrow. Now, in my framework, I did show that we had two finite areas, prescribing list and the adaptation list. Those are things that are frozen in time. Of course, we have pharmacists that can safely and effectively prescribe for things beyond those lists. The only mechanism to do so under today's law, however, is a collaborative practice agreement. So we certainly have pharmacists, especially in AMCARE and institutional settings, that are modifying uh, anticoagulants, modifying diabetes drugs, adding on therapies if diabetes outcomes aren't achieved. So the mechanism for them to do so today is under a collaborative practice agreement. So if something isn't on that finite independent prescribing list, uh, the collaborative practice agreement does give them an additional avenue uh, to at least uh, attempt to practice within their clinical ability. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I'll say that I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to try to balance them by jumping between the two. So um, just FYI. So Jeff, you're up next. And okay. my question that I see for you um, really kind of talks about that implementation advisory committee that you mentioned. You said how impactful it was, but that it was convened with a group of individuals, like a multi-stakeholder group, that wasn't necessarily all pharmacists. So can you describe more about that composition and how you came about kind of building that implementation advisory group? Oh, absolutely. It was a, it was a very powerful group. And I have to admit that uh, during the legislative uh, sausage making, if you will, uh, it was, it was proposed that one was necessary by, uh, by the health plan. And my initial thought was, Hey, this is just a delay tactic. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, it was, Certainly um, important work, and I think ultimately it ended up speeding things up. But uh, the the makeup of the board, essentially the legislation put the onus of, of creation of this advisory committee on this group one health board or, or on a an entity that was selected by the insurance commissioner's office, uh, and they had done a lot of work with this group. Uh, we had representatives from the medical community, so the medical association, the hospital association, uh, from from payers um, uh, in state, the blues as well as out of state, uh, and and uh, the healthcare authority who oversees our Medicaid program. Uh, we had nurses, uh, nursing association. We had um, pharmacists that uh, were uh, representing uh, health systems that had pharmacists doing clinical work, uh, clinics that had pharmacists doing clinical work, and uh, out um, you know community pharmacy and outpatient settings uh, that had pharmacists doing clinical work. So a number of different uh, individuals uh, were participating in this. Uh, and, and really the idea was, uh, to how, do we, how are we going to treat pharmacists uh, in this space? The consensus throughout was to treat pharmacists as, as uh, anybody else would be treated. But there's uh, three documents that came out of that, and I think they'd be very valuable for folks. The first one is a frequently asked questions document that really was utilized to level the playing field and, and address assumptions and, and mis, misperceptions. So we talked about the pharmacist training, the pharmacist um, uh, scope of practice, uh, what are our 
collaborative practice agreements, and, and uh, we call them uh, uh, collaborative drug therapy agreements, uh, and, and what do they allow and what don't they allow and how are they regulated? All of these components. Then from the from our side, we, we got to understand a little bit more about credentialing, who does the credentialing, how it's done in the various settings, um, and privileging, uh, and, and demystify that process. Um, and so uh, the frequently asked questions uh, document was really beneficial. And then we outlined uh, the, the health plan policy directives that's a separate document, and then provider expectations. Uh, and as I summed them up, um, you know, it really just outlines that pharmacists need to abide and, and uh, by all the current regulations out there and, and be received and, and regulated by the plans um, in, in a similar way as all other healthcare providers. But it gets into the, some, the very specific components of that. Those are public documents that if you were to, uh, to Google One Health Port, um, Senate Bill 5557, you get to see who was on that committee. There's uh, letters and then there's those documents are, are made available. Uh, and I highly recommend those to folks who are looking at uh, what it would take to implement. Um, it, it was a very valuable uh, piece of work that, that helped us as we were looking at what pharmacists needed to do to be in this space and the, and the employers on that side, but also when we're working with health plans who were trying to figure out this law and in a little greater detail what they could do to help comply with it. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that and for letting us know to, to Google. It was 5557, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's perfect. It's in gross substitute uh, Senate bill. So ESSB 5557, I think, is how they have it on their website. Um, but one health port is all one word. Awesome, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, Alex, your turn. Um, one of our attendees wanted to see if you could explain more about um, the pharmacist, uh, the uptake of pharmacist inter independent prescribing authority and what type of pushback, if any, came from any medical associations or prescribers. Um, it's almost kind of going back to your, your first comment that you were addressing in that, that balance between that static list of independent prescribing versus drugs that can be added on uh, collaborative practice. So how do you add something to that static list and how do you balance that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we talked about the gap between scope of practice and clinical ability. The other gap is the gap between what the law allows and what uptake is in practice. And historically, um, uptake, especially in the, the, the years after a law takes effect, is light. Like, even if you look at uh, contraceptive prescribing in California, one of the studies says 10%. In Oregon, one of the studies says 30%. So a lot of people look at limited uptake as a negative. I actually look at it as a positive. It shows that pharmacists are operating within their sphere of comfort. And many of these things I see as a generational shift. We're training people to practice in this model in the future rather than creating a system where uh, folks have been practicing for decades are, are, are backfilling some of these roles. So I, I'm, not, uh, uh, I, I'm not one to believe that limited uptake is a bad thing. If you look at the pharmacies that have put out press releases in Idaho saying they're offering services, uh, we estimate 20 to 30 percent of pharmacies are currently offering the services. Now, they might not be offering everything on that list. We have some pharmacies that have limited their focus to urinary tract infections, cold sores, and statins, for example whereas others have focused on flu and uh, strep throat. So when I say 20 to 30 percent, that means they've announced that they're prescribing at least to some extent, but it might not mean they're doing everything on that independent prescribing list. Um, to add something to the list, we have rulemaking authority for it. We are in active rulemaking, and we're proposing to add a couple things uh, to the list uh, this, this year. So it is something where uh, it can be added to um, through the rulemaking process. We've put out a framework for why we would add something to the list, and it's an evidence-based framework. We said we'll only consider things for which pharmacists have a safe and effective track record of having prescribed it elsewhere. So a lot of those comparison studies are coming from other states, international jurisdictions, or through collaborative practice models where we have to make the leap of saying, well, if it was done under collaborative practice, can we replicate those safeguards and do it independently? Uh, we've also uh, have parameters around what we can add. We would only add things that uh, are minor ailments, things that can be either self-diagnosed or easily diagnosed 
in the absence of a full complete electronic medical record or we would only add things that can be diagnosed uh, through a clear wave test uh, clear wave test being things that are so simple and easy to use that the risk of error is is, is pretty minimal so um, that, that's kind of the framework for how we would add in terms of the pushback uh, we got you know I, I think anytime you talk about expanded roles for any professional uh, you get uh, some concerns over whether or not it would be safe. And I think because of our evidence-based approach and looking at the studies from other jurisdictions, I think we were able to assuage a fair number of those concerns. We might not have been able to assuage all of the concerns, but I think we got to the point where uh, especially the, the legislature had confidence that uh, the appropriate safeguards and sideboards had been put around this to make this safe and effective. So ultimately at the legislature when that prescribing list was approved, my recollection is it was approved unanimously because of those sideboards that we had put um, around it. I think the important thing to know though is that there's not even the shared view within the profession. There's some pharmacists who don't think, you know, that especially um, pharmacists who are well credentialed, some of them don't think that the average pharmacist should be doing this. And then there are some uh, pharmacists, especially in chain settings that look at this with a jaded eye and say, oh, great, one more thing for the chain to, to metric and cram down my throat as I get to the third car in the drive through and don't get any additional support staff. So, you know, you'll get uh, some pushback even within the profession. Now, the caveat is policy, policy is not well made based off of perceptions and policy is not well made based off of the lowest common denominator. So, Nonetheless, we used our evidence-based framework, and I think the limited uptake that a lot of states have is frankly a good thing because it shows that uh, those who are able to do it safely and effectively have moved forward, while as those who might have been a little bit more reticent did not uh, move forward, and I think frankly that's a good thing. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, looking at the time, I think I'm going to be able to squeeze in two more questions one directed solely to Jeff and then one for, for both of you. So, Jeff, um, the question that kind of came out was, what kind of education or outreach did you have to do with the payers to ensure reimbursement? Because you gave us the, the legislative story saying, you know, this is why pharmacists are healthcare providers and you should be reimbursing us. But, you know, what were those like minor steps to get them to kind of finally say, all right, here you go. Um, and then from that, can you give any examples of a service for a specific medical condition like diabetes or hypertension that was implemented that was very specific in scope of practice? Sure. Uh, well, so the, the law essentially uh, required the health plans to have an adequate number of pharmacists in their provider network. Uh, so there wasn't a, um, you know, we, we've been working with them for years to say, hey, you should have pharmacists in their networks, and, and the commercial plan could if they saw value to that. Um, what they uh, didn't want to do, uh, at least in the testimony, was uh, build a system to have pharmacists in their networks when they hadn't um, previous. They said it would be a lot of work, uh, and what this required was them to do that work. Uh, they, there were some that had pharmacists uh, being paid for services uh, in self-insured networks before that. Uh, case in point, Virginia Mason Medical Center uh, had, uh, being a self-insured employer, had requested that pharmacists were in their provider network. So when the doors opened uh, in, in 2016, Virginia Mason had all their pharmacists credentialed and contracted in, the, in, in their delegated credential agreements ready to go, and they were providing care immediately. Uh, in those settings, uh, it was more about implementation of, uh, you know, the in, inside the health system, how they were going to um, privilege those pharmacists, um, you know, based off of their credentials. Uh, but they've been providing that care, uh, as I mentioned before, for a long time. So from a payer standpoint, uh, it was mostly about uh, educating uh, their internal components and uh, removing the barriers that, that said that a pharmacist couldn't provide that care. But they have been treating uh, the pharmacy provided uh, service claims in a similar fashion as they treat something from a nurse practitioner or a PA or the like. Um, pharmacists are building the same codes. There's no, no unique or different codes. So what we've seen is uh, E&M office visit codes, uh, the, 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 the uh, consulting codes that, that are, are utilized in uh, chronic disease state management uh, as the, the vast majority of the claims that have been processed uh, and those pharmacists working in those health clinic, uh, the healthcare settings, whether it's a health system or a clinic, have been providing anti-coag, diabetes, 
uh, hypertension, um, multi-disease uh, state care for, for a long time, and now they, they just went through the process of billing those. Those services um, ha have been provided, uh, gosh, I, I can't even give you the number. This isn't a study, and it was open to all uh, care that can be provided under the scope, so we didn't roll out any specific services. What I can tell you is that uh, in the first seven months, we have just a, a snippets of data um, throughout. Virginia Mason shared uh, their data with us, and they had uh, a number of provider visits uh, that um, they, they had already been doing for years uh, that they, instead of um, having nurse practitioners billing for them or PAs billing for them, the pharmacists were billing for them because they felt that they were the appropriate care provider for that, that care. Um, and it integrated into their their normal routine. Uh, in the community setting, uh, it's been a, a heavier lift uh, for folks. And so we have a pharmacy that's a, a, a great example. Uh, they have uh, been working to tar target that uh, the HIV um, pre-exposure prophylaxis access. Uh, and so they've been approached by some payers in our state to say, hey, can you help us with this? We'd love to contract with you. And, uh, and they're providing that in conjunction with uh, uh, with Bailey Boucher and HIV AIDS Home and, and other uh, groups um, that have identified a need um, for uh, prevention of, of HIV AIDS. And, and this particular um, pharmacy has one pharmacist doing this um, at all times. And so they have several pharmacists um, on, on that team and, and uh, they are now providing, I think they've provided a, over a thousand of those um, of those regimens uh, and that that care over the past year, uh, and they're billing level four E and M codes. Um, there were some anti coag codes that have been utilized, uh, and and some one offs on the service, but for the most part, they're doing levels two, three, four, and even up to five in some really complex uh, scenarios. Uh, and uh, they've been um, you know working with under the same confines as every other payer so, or uh, every other provider, so the payers haven't had to do a lot on the back end for that other than just let them uh, be uh, uh, to, to be claims that they would uh, consider in their, in their review process. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I know that we are at the top of the hour. I do think this last question is, is very important. It summarizes everything for us. Um, so if you both could maybe take 30 seconds or less and say what are the best resources for individuals at maybe a national or federal level, or even those that are in different states to help push their states along, similar to uh, the advanced practice that you both are doing. Uh, this is Alex. I think, you know, leverage the experiences of other jurisdictions. So where can you learn about the experiences of other jurisdictions to organizations, NASPA, the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations, and NABP, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, uh, tremendous resources, tremendous uh, uh, tremendous assets that they could be to your organizations as you leverage the uh, experiences of others. And uh, I would echo uh, the the leveraging the experience side um, from a standpoint of legislative movement, which I know is uh, difficult for Alex to address. Um, I, I really think that. Uh, individuals that are uh, interested in, in movement in their states uh, should talk to their uh, state associations about ongoing efforts and how they can contribute uh, to to those outcomes. And, and you know, from a uh, reiteration back to NASPA, the National Anti State Pharmacy Associations, a number of the uh, state execs are, are continually sharing the lessons learned. Um, case in point, our, our efforts in, in Washington State. Um, because of conversations uh, at that at those very committee meetings have um, allowed Tennessee uh, the Intel to uh, to make that happen in their state this past year so they they opened the door up in Tennessee uh, based off of the uh, the same sort of uh, insurance code um, legislation that that we did so uh, I would I would heavily recommend that and then those documents that I talked about uh, from One Health Port are very valuable because if, as I mentioned before, if folks are looking to do this, there's no law that says that a, a plan can't have, a commercial plan can't have pharmacists in their, uh, in their provider networks. Uh, the only one that exists is at the, at the uh, Medicare level and the, the efforts that we're doing in federal provider status. So 
if they see a value and you can uh, you know utilize the uh, the the work in that consensus document making to to help open up uh, pockets of of uh, pharmacists providing this care and being recognized, um, you can do it without legislation, and, and I would highly recommend that you consider that. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. And again, I want to thank Jeff and Alex for joining us today in this presentation, and thank you everybody for that has joined us and stayed on a couple minutes late. Um, as our final slide here, I just want to remind everybody again that we do have another quality form coming up in two weeks, and then in November we have the PQA Leadership Summit and our Social Determinants of Health form. If you have questions about either of those, please reach out to, or any of those, reach out to any member of PQA staff. Again, thank you for attending today, and we look forward to having you on future webinars and events. Thank you, and have a great day.